but many things on soap opera have changed. They are certainly more elaborately produced now. And there's more Mention Thomas Hoving to anyone in the art world for, say, oh, the last 20 to 50 years, and whatever their opinion of his personality and methods, they will admit that he made art more accessible. Here he is during a six-year stint as art editor of ABC's 2020 program, covering everything from soap operas to masterpiece paintings to hockey. Hugh, I've seen a lot of hockey games, both professional and amateur, and there's never been anything in hockey history like the way the American team played for the Olympic gold. Yes, hockey. His knack for not only sensing what will appeal to the masses, but also being able to translate highbrow concepts into everyday terms literally changed American culture. He's authored several books, including Art for Dummies and Making the Mummies Dance, about his time at the Met, which started, as he puts it, with a stroke of great timing and luck. After the Marine Corps, I went to graduate school at Princeton in art and archaeology. And then, in my first year, I got so sick and tired of looking at black and white photographs, I went to Europe with my wife, young wife, for three months, and we stayed two years. The GI Bill of Rights, the dollar, We've never lived better in our lives, and we came back, and I finished graduate school, and I lucked out. When he returned to the U.S., Hoving ended up giving a presentation on Florentine art. After the talk, a man came up to him and asked him to come with him to his office at the Met. So he said, well, why don't you come up to my office, and we'll just have a chat. And we went up, and while we're getting in his office, he assumes I knew exactly who he is. You know, he's a celebrity, he thinks. I didn't know who it was. So we get in the office, I knew it was big time because he had three secretary desks, you know, big. That's not a curator. And then I began to look at the mail, you know. You know, you know I can look at things that I'm not. James J. Roar, a director, I said, we got into his office, he puts his army boots up on the table and he said, well, Mr. Hoving, what about your future? Two months later, Hoving was hired. He was 26 years old. I was the curatorial assistant at $5,005 a year, August 1st, 1959. And in the first month, I lucked into one of the most extraordinary discoveries that the Met had ever found, and everybody thought it was a forgery. I proved it wasn't. We bought it. I smuggled it out of Italy, the good old days, and it made my career. Luck. Or is it? Seven years later, he was directing the Met, and already recognized for his photographic memory and penchant for painstaking, if unorthodox, research. Take the discovery he mentioned during the first month at the Met. He spent three sleepless days in the archives comparing hundreds of photos of pieces of art, narrowed those down to six, checked footnotes and obscure articles about those until he honed in on one. I rushed off a cable to this dealer because I had already declined it. I was ordered to you know, say no. I said, hold it for us. What are the measurements? It came back identical. Okay. Then I said so. to the dealer, I said, it took me three days to do this, kind of not sleeping much. In the library until two or three in the morning, just going through hundreds of photographs and putting aside quickly. Anything that looked vaguely like it in style. And then they all stacked up to one thing, right? And I said to the dealer, where is this piece? He said, last time I saw it was leaning up against a wrecked Fiat in a garage in Genoa. It was just the first of many acquisitions he oversaw at the Met that framed a reputation for having quirky, risky, and very, very costly style. They ranged from the hit exhibit of King Tut's treasures, to the Temple of Dendor, to a photographic exhibit called Harlem on My Mind. So controversial, it sparked a riot. The Met thrived, but Hoving's methods put his job on the line four times. It sounds like you talk your way into a lot of... Yes. These situations. Yes. But then I do horrible illegal things when I'm in the fury of acquisitions. Really? And I broke into a vitrine in the biggest museum in Florence called the Bargello to be able to see an ivory and look at the back of it and put it back. But I knew from my museum of cloisters, when I saw that there was a funny little wire, I knew that they had wet cell batteries that made the alarm ring when you opened a case so I'd was able to disengage that because I knew from our piece in the close, these two huge batteries we used to have. And I opened up the case with my Swiss Army knife and put it back. I wasn't going to steal anything. But I knew it would have taken eight months for me to go through channels. So you did it the other way? Yeah. You put it back? Of course. Yeah. Well, so it wasn't really that illegal. Well, it's kind of a unprofessional way of doing research. <laughs> well, 2020's art editor, Tom Hoving, is here with us. 
Hoving regrets none of it. He believes that art is as important as food or air, and therefore everyone, from the rich and famous to Joe Q, not only should but needs to partake in it, particularly at the Met, which he helped make the most popular and well-respected museum in America. I used to walk through the galleries, French 18th century paintings, you know? Talk about not so popular. And I'd grab eight or ten people to say, hey, I'm, I'm the director of this place, come over, I want to do an experiment with you. And I'd take them into this 18th century French gallery and I said, I'm going to leave for three minutes, I'm going to come back and I want every one of you to tell me the finest thing in this gallery. And you know nothing about this stuff. 99% of the time, they picked the thing that I knew was the absolute best of the gallery. Really? Because art talks. Art talks to you. That's why it's made. It has voices. You don't need to know anything about Genesis or anything about how a marble piece bought in the 14th century with a crack in it was used by Michelangelo Buonarroti to make this seven foot tall, gorgeous adolescent kid looking off with some fear and some hope with this thing in his hand. You don't have to know anything about that to know that this is one dynamic 14 year old guy that may make it. This is David. Yes, but you don't have to know anything about the, uh, all of that. And to see Jackson Pollock and those energetic thrums of paint, you don't have to know anything about abstract expressionism in New York school or whatever, because it goes wham. I can pick a fake from here to the museum, from the camera to us, I can pick a fake in a hundredth of a second. Because I've been saturated. I've held so many things of all fields in my hands and studied them. I ran a museum in which there were 50,000 50, years of works of art, three million pieces. And when I was a young curator, I would stay after hours and be allowed to take all the stuff out of the cases and hold it and touch it and see what was on the bottom. And if it said made in Taiwan and it was supposed to be French 16th century, you knew there was something slightly <laughs> awry, right? Now, what about on a level like most of us? Uh, my mother swears that she found an original Gorman watercolor yeah, painting. Yeah, Juan O'Gorman. Yes. Yeah. At a garage sale for 10 Juan O'Gorman may be the third most forged person in history, with Salvador Dali being number one. Is he real? I would think Dolly would be really hard to... No, they made prints and his phony signatures. By the, he, before he died, he took uh, 10,000 pieces of blank paper and signed them. He was in for the money. <laughs> Hoving counsels to call him if you question something isn't original. And if you can't get him, invest what you can in what you love. Work of art and the, the human being is, is very intimate. And it really doesn't matter if you read into an abstract painting that there's children in the garden in the lower left hand. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that first you had that hit and you were attracted to it. And then if it grows, if it matures with you and on you, then you know you have something. Regardless of what it costs, regardless, regardless of, of anything. Then you have something that really is good. valuable. Yes. For you, but not in bucks. Money and art don't mix. We also asked why he is a champion of small museums like a Gunquit Museum of American Art. It's small in size, and what's delicious about it is you don't get visual overload. You don't get this visual fatigue where you, your eyes are kind of, you know, in those horror films, your eyes are dribbling down. You know, you look like <laughs> Keith Ledger in Dark Knight, you know, you know, after about six galleries. And my old museum, the Met, has too many things on the wall. You go out of your mind. They had a Turner show there, the British painter of the 18th, 19th mm -hmm. century. 150 things, 10 galleries. Da -da. I mean, that alone. Da -da. Da -da. Da -da -da. One other turner, I'm going to kill him. You know, it's <laughs> at the, in the sixth out of 10 galleries, you really want to find the guy and smash him, you know. And <laughs> After the Louvre, I just felt drained. And I, I wrote an article for my magazine, Connoisseur, called The Louvre in 59 Minutes Flat, and you should read it. Yes. Yeah. Just go to the 10 great pieces in there. Heck with all that other brown stuff. Don't be distracted. Nah, even if it's a Rubens. Yeah, lousy Rubens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would go just for the Venus de Milo. And a dear friend of mine found the finger. It's in that case next to it. You saw the little case with this, the hand? This was, um... This, she, she found it years ago. She found it in the Louvre storeroom. They didn't know they had it. Does this stuff happen all the time? Yes, it happens all the time. Yeah. It's, it, but it's hard for us to believe. But it's hard for me to believe, you know. Why couldn't they have found it? It was sitting right there all the time.
Hoving is equally blunt when it comes to advice for artists trying to break onto the scene. Have a very healthy independent income. Seriously? Yeah. It's the toughest. It's the toughest. If it's about as, uh, the chances for success are about as successful as somebody wanting to write an old style Broadway musical. It sounds like your career advice to artists, anyone, would be believe in yourself. Absolutely. Believe in your word. And be slightly nutty. And be, have no self-confidence. And then you'll have a lot.